All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the August 3rd meeting of the Rotary Club of Louisville. Please silence your cell phones. I'm Mark Poole. I'm a wealth management advisor at Capitalist Planning Partners, and I am your president for the day. So some of you are already regretting showing up. Uh, and it, the best part is, it thanks to winning bid um, in March at our fundraiser, and, and, and this young man over here, my dad, made the winning bid, so I get to do this for free, which is awesome. Uh, it says, feel free to add a little bit about yourself and your rotary story. Well, my rotary story began when I was negative one in 1982 when my dad joined this club. My personal rotary story went all the way through our auction days, which I uh, lived for and helping out um, at Churchill Downs for Scoutorama. And eventually, you know, I think uh, before surgery at one point, my dad said, you know, if anything happens, one thing I'd like for you to do is join rotary. I'm like, I'm not going to say no now. So that was uh, seven or eight years ago, and here we are today. So providing our invitation today is Alice Bridges. She's the principal at AOB Consulting, a past club president. Of course, one of the best darn presidents we've ever had. She's also been a Rotarian of the Year, and she is a Paul Harris Fellow plus six.
Rick, go ahead. Recently, and we passed a rotary sign in St. Martin. And I said, Oh, look, 
there was a Rotary Club meeting, and one of my friends in Paducah said, what do you do at Rotary? And it was that simple. And so now he's on his way to becoming a member of the Paducah Rotary Club. So don't forget, marketing is everything. Uh, I'd like to invite Ben Smock, the Director of Development at Canopy Certified Inc., to the podium to introduce our speaker for today. Ben, take it away. Thank you. Our Brayton Bowen is an organization consultant, author, educator, and keynote speaker. He has served as senior officer for Fortune 500 companies, including General Mills, Federated, and Capital Holding Corporation, now Agon, and has more than 25 years of corporate and consulting experience. He leads the Howland Group, a strategy, consulting, human resource development, and change management firm based in Louisville and is the compassionate advocate and CEO for Building Better Worlds of Work. Brayton has authored numerous works, including Recognizing and Rewarding Employees, The Incredible Power of a Pat on the Back, Leading in the Face of Terrorism, and When Bad Things Happen to Good Managers, a guide for dealing with job loss and personal life change. His most recent work, Engaging the Heart for People, Performance, and Profit, Seven Competencies of Compassion at Work is available on Amazon.com. His advice and opinions have been featured nationally in nationally recognized publications, including Harvard's Management Update, Across the Board, Management Review, HR Magazine, Industry Week, Association Management, Christian Science Monitor, Retail Business Review, Training, and the Wall Street Journal. Brayton has been invited to teach at the University of Phoenix, Northwood University, McKendree University, and Indiana University Southeast. He holds a bachelor's and master's degrees from Brown University. Join me in welcoming Brayton. Thank you, Ben. Make sure that the volume is not too loud. How is the level? Is it okay? All right. My thanks to the Rotary Club for inviting me here today. And I kind of joke around on this. I'm a substitute for your other speaker, but it's an honor to be here. It's a great organization. I was a member a number of years ago when we were meeting downtown. So let me begin with a question. What comes to mind when I mention the word compassion? Anyone? The word compassion, what do you think of? Love? Giving. Kindness? Giving? Support. Giving. Support. Well, compassion is uh, frequently associated with words like mercy, empathy, caring, and love. Words which in today's society seem to be of dubious value to some. Particularly those who are weaponizing their communications to attack other people. By extension, our culture in the United States today appears to be taking on the form of a tribal society where the dismemberment of our culture into subgroups or tribes, such as racial and religious minorities, political factions, and sexual orientation, are tribalized. And this condition enables the leaders, be they corporatists or fascists, of the tribes to maintain control. Tribal members are angry we experience that on a daily basis. I don't know about you, but if you drive on the highway today, undoubtedly, the car behind you may be climbing up into your exhaust pipe. Or they may be passing you on the right, cutting you off, racing through stop signs and stoplights, because they really don't care about you. It's all about them. And for the most part, they are angry. They are angry. Have you been to a family gathering where members attack one another over their political positions or sexual views? Anybody? Let me see a show of hands. How many of you have that experience? Thank you. 
All right. Well, we're among friends because we all have. Words like remote, robotic, unemotional are descriptors of the new workplace. As thousands of employees work remotely and corporate landscapes are reshaped. Where the corporations plan to shed thousands more and reduce expenses. And even though employers are looking for employees, the, the, the space, corporate space, costs money. So by shrinking that space, they're able to save on corporate overhead. But in the ravages of the global pandemic, the perils of organizational distancing are emerging and indeed intensifying as the distant become more <coughs> inanimate and less precious. COVID-19 forced people to seek shelter and to avoid assembling in public and traveling. Working from home has become the norm in the new normal. Homeschooling of offspring is part of the new norm. In the meantime, what is lost in the new normal is a compassionate concern for those who are organizationally distanced and lost in the appreciation of the incredible value of their meta knowledge. Lost is compassionate leadership and constructive organization cultures. This condition works both ways as organizations become less compassionate about the employees and employees become less compassionate about their respective organizations. I want to make one reference to a source that I value. The French sociologist Emile Durkheim in his study on suicide described the society in which we now live as a society of anomie, that's spelled A-N-O-M-I-E or A-N-O-M-Y, in which a condition of instability in societies and individuals is a breakdown of standards and values, a lack of purpose, a lack of ideals. Those in that kind of society, which is a description of our society, are angry. And when anger turns inward, it results in suicide. 51% of the gun deaths in this country are by suicide. Suicide by cop is another model, as we saw recently at a local bank, where the assailants expect to be killed. So in today's talk, I want to discuss the concept of competencies of compassion in the workplace. I may not be able to save the world, you may not be able to, but we can do better in workplaces. In fact, I'm going to address five of the seven competencies, but I'll touch on all seven, that inspire employees, improve organizational performance, and increase profits up to 40% and more. Let me repeat, increase profits up to 40% and more. You see, a lot of people don't think that being kind, being compassionate, which sounds like touchy-feely, is profitable. But in fact, it is. So I will highlight the organizations in Louisville that are making a difference. talks about the new normal. 
Developing compassionate leaders, absolutely critical. And you will see some metrics that we use to identify how effective leaders can be in the new normal. Also, developing constructive organization cultures. So let me give you a prelude to the new normal. 45 million people resigned during the pandemic. Two and a half million people refused to return. More than a million will never return, having suffered death in the pandemic. Two million fewer women are in the workplace, and the overturning of Roe v. Wade means that there will be even fewer women available in the workplace. Immigrant labor is blocked by border policies in the absence of legislative reform. And racial biases and conditions, which I described, are on the rise. So living the new normal, what does it look like? Quiet quitting will continue, even when people find the jobs that they are going to make an income in, they may not be satisfied with what it gives to them emotionally and professionally. And so they just simply quit. I know of any number of situations where employees are hired and the next day they don't appear. And maybe you're familiar with those stories as well. Distancing, we know about social distancing during the pandemic. Organizational distancing, terminology that I've adopted, strains relations. Work of commitment to the organization lessens. Attraction, retention, and turnover, those are metrics in organizations, are all impacted. And workplace violence and stress and emotional welfare is a problem. So let me talk about my personal journey, if you will. Following graduate school, I taught private school, of all things Latin and Greek. How about that? And uh, went on eventually to uh, join an organization, a retail firm, in human resources. And my orientation was to be administratively responsible, follow the policies, orient people accordingly, and I was pretty much an administrative type. In 1986, I came to Louisville, Kentucky with Capital Holding Corporation. My office overlooked the property of the Courier Journal in Standard of Europe. I saw elements of the massacre that occurred at Standard of Europe at that time. I saw Mayor Abramson helping with the bodies getting them to the hospital or getting them to wherever. Anger in the workplace grew over the next 10 years. And in 1999, I did a five-part documentary series for public radio that we are throughout the country. Mass shootings, Columbine, 1999. I actually spoke at Rotary at that time and talked about the Columbine massacre, and I predicted that there would be more, and indeed, that trend, unfortunately, has continued. But September 11, 2001, was the turning point in my professional career, where I became less administrative and more compassionate. So that's technically the pivot point for me in my career and in my thinking. And then in 2016, Tom Williams and our previous mayor, Greg Fisher, invited me to work with them on the partnership for Compassion at Louisville. And so I supervised the team on organizations, for-profit and not-for-profit. A colleague of mine and I reviewed the some 200 organizations who had signed on to be partners. And we identified seven key competencies of compassion. And subsequently, 
I published this book, Engaging the Heart for People, Performance, and Profit, and also founded my second consultancy on building better worlds of work. So 9-11, to themselves and in turn 
more valuable to the organization. Leadership is a driving force in terms of the competencies of compassion. Compassionate leaders enhance the skills and abilities of workers for their benefit, as well as for the benefit of the organization. In the work that we do, we profile the styles and the behaviors of leaders to assess how constructive their behaviors are. And we work with them to optimize their effectiveness. This is one of the instruments that we use. There are other instruments that are available. Clifton Strengths, for example, uh, developed by Gallup, uses an instrument that's very effective. We use um, this system um, and um, it identifies um, 12, this is by human synergistics, it identifies 12 thinking and behavioral styles. And the blue section of this circular graph is the section in which the leadership styles will ensure the success of the organization. It will ensure the achievement of goals and objectives. It is ensuring of the compassionate aspect, the team aspect, and the actualization of the organization's goal and those of the individuals. This particular model um, includes uh, different organizations, um, including actually five, heavy manufacturing, high technological, uh, manufacturing, technology manufacturing, bank, banking, and uh, biomedical. So one of the, whoops, I think I turned that off. Can I get it back on? All right, I'm about to be saved. <laughs> I hope. There you go, bless you, we got it. So one of the organizations, one of the individuals that we discovered in this study was the person of Corinna Boreas, the executive director for La Casita Center. Her philosophy is to lead from within the circle. She believes that the people in the organization who converse with her are equal, and they communicate with one another. If you're not familiar with La Casita, they provide more than 52,000 services for immigrants and refugees annually in this greater market. They have over 3,400 volunteer hours annually. More than 3,000 individuals are served. They believe in compassion. And they are passionate about that. In the technical world, Corinna is a level five leader engaging and the concept of I and we. The whole area of rewards, you know, it's interesting, I, I, I wrote another piece um, that um, uh, I can reference subsequently, but um, Alfie Cohn uh, wrote a, uh, a book um, and it was a, a study that he centered on in Kentucky's educational system. And he basically mentioned or described how uh, the uh, manipulation of uh, teachers with the stars and A's and all of that took away the focus on education and uh, in fact uh, was, uh, was not very productive. And so in the work that we, we do, we focus uh, on what I call the five R's of reward systems. The first is responsibility. That's the design of the job. We know that employees will work for not-for-profit organizations at a third of the salary that they would get in a for-profit organization because they are committed to the mission and vision of the organization. They believe that they are transforming lives, and in turn, their life is being transformed. These five R's are statistically significant. This is the most significant, statistically, of the five R's. The next is respect. 
The next is relations, customers and supervisor. Recognition, that's the implicit appreciation. And then rewards, the explicit, you know, the nickels, dimes, dollars, etc. While that is statistically significant, it is the least significant of the five R's. So the needs and plans of employees must be recognized. You know, when organizations manipulate the compensation system and the benefit system, many times they don't appreciate the fact that the employee is not planning on retiring there. So it's not the retirement plan that is attracting the employees. It's the incorporation of their goals and objectives. Saving for a car, saving for a down payment on a home. How does that get accomplished? And so they incorporate elements of savings plans. They modify the benefits program so that the employee picks specific elements that will satisfy their needs and wants. You can learn more about recognition and rewards <laughs> uh, by this book uh, published by McGraw-Hill. No, I'm not promoting it, I promise. I'm not selling. Um, another dimension, constructive cultures. Constructive cultures. People in constructive cultures are six times more likely to be engaged on the job. We can do the same kind of me metrics like you saw with that uh, 12 section uh, circle to identify how constructive an organization is. Constructive organizations uh, have 12.5% greater productivity. Teams that receive feedback have 8.9% greater profitability. And turnover rates are generally 14.9% lower. Spalding University turned out to be the poster organization for a constructive culture. 2011, Spalding was certified as the world's first compassionate university, a testament to their dedication to service and the promotion of peace and justice. Their organizational culture aligns faculty, students, and programs to deliver success. Up to 40% improvement in performance can be achieved by changing an organization's culture. And I refer to uh, Dr. Jeffrey Pfeffer at Stanford for that verification. Corporate social responsibility, CSR. In one survey, 93% of the respondents want to work for a company that cares about them as an individual. 51% will not work for a company that does not have strong social and environmental commitments. And 74% said their job was more fulfilling when they are provided opportunities to make a positive impact at work and in their community. And Rotary, I applaud you for some of the initiatives that you are taking on, including this whole gun uh, reform. You know, it's interesting, I had a speaker um, address a group, um, a, uh, an assistant professor from uh, U of L on gun control, and she uh, recognized that the four gun and the anti-gun uh, people have very strong positions. And so the question was, will this gun problem ever get resolved in this country? You know what the answer was? Only when the K generation is in charge. Because they are the ones who are affected with school shootings and the attacks on them in the educational systems. So social responsibility. Good for the Soul, Sun and Realtor was our poster organization. They completed 25 bills uh, with uh, Habitat for Community, uh, for Habit, sorry, for Humanity, and they're on their 26th. We're almost finished. So the seven corporate standouts, Spalding University for Culture, I didn't talk about Humana and their diversity DEI program. I will tell you that they achieved outstanding results at the end of the year for their program. The one thing that I learned in doing the work that I do and in focusing on organizations like Juana is that they create these employee resource groups where white people come together, you know, minorities, women, veterans, etc. The problem with that is it creates 
more silos, more tribes. And so the emphasis should be more on uh, intersectional analysis, where all of these elements are combined. Um, Kentucky Center uh, was our poster child for recognition and rewards, EPS for stewardship, Brown Foreman on values. It's an interesting story. There was an employee who was an alcoholic uh, in recovery. She didn't drink alcohol. She would go to social gatherings at the company and wouldn't, you know, imbibe. And they would say, you know, what's wrong with this person? Well, she went to human resources to tell what her situation was. They invented a drink called Spirit, non-alcoholic, so that when she went to functions, she would not feel uncomfortable when they would offer her something that was appropriate for her needs and wants. It's like taking the sugar out of Coca-Cola. Imagine, who would have imagined? Um, leadership, like the seat center and seminar realtors, customer, uh, brother, uh, cultural um, uh, compassion. So, uh, cor corporate social responsibility. And so, the whole story, bringing it all together, monetizing compassion, involves leadership, ethics and values, culture, engagement, stewardship, recognition and rewards, corporate social responsibility to produce profits and create a brand identity. Further information, uh, I think we're giving away a complimentary copy of uh, Engaging the Heart for People, Performance and Profit. And uh, you'll also get a, a, a free handout uh, if you communicate with Rotary or you communicate with me, it's a, it's a 12 page document uh, on the uh, principles of compassion. I promise if you send me an email, I'm not, I'm not promoting it. I won't follow up with you, only if you ask me uh, to be in, in touch with you. So I, I, don't, uh, I don't work at uh, cross purposes. So um, in essence, you hold the key to changing the environment changing the way things are done in organizations today. I wish you well. God love you. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. Thank you for your presentation. 
on Ben Smock from Canopy and Induce View. And I, I wonder if you could compare and contrast your model around compassion with what you think that Canopy does around good business. Uh, well, that's uh, fairly easy because uh, Ben and I have been on the same panel before speaking to uh, audiences on uh, compassion. Um, I am on the board for uh, Elsher and Google Society for Human Resource Management. I'm director of programming, and um, we are promoting uh, the services of Canopy to our HR professionals because we believe uh, that organizations that become certified in compassion become extremely knowledgeable of what the requirements are. So I think we're aligned. Did I respond to your question? Oh, okay. So, and if you have any other questions, because I think we may be out of time, I'm more than happy to meet with you afterwards. Yes? Uh, Delaine Taylor, Executive Director of the Club. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to mention that Brayton shared with me that he would offer um, two free one-hour coaching sessions. Um, there is an application. You can, uh, I will have a link to that in the follow-up email. So if you would like to sit down with him and talk about ways that you could incorporate being a compassion advocate into your organization, there's an opportunity for you to follow up. So thank you. Yeah, Ray, we have one more official duty, and that is you have to draw for our door prize, which is a copy of this book. The last four is 1921. 1921. Everybody look at the blue ticket. 1921. Yeah, I'll see. All right, we got a winner back there. We'll get that to you. Great. Great, in your honor today, we will be making a donation uh, to the West Louisville Housing Commission. Speaker next week is Barry Dunn, and this is a personal plug for Barry. Barry is the president and CEO of Cozair for Kids, uh, which is Cozair Charities in most of our minds and hearts, but please just call Cozair for Kids for his sanity. Be sure to be registered by uh, noon on Monday. I think you will find Barry's message. You just never met somebody so passionate about it in your life, so it'll be awesome. Also, save the date as well. Attorney General Daniel Cameron will speak to our club on August 24th. Again, that's August 24th uh, for the Attorney General. Questions must be submitted uh, to the lovely and talented Ashley Brower no later than August 22nd. We have invited uh, Governor Bashir to speak as well, and we're working with his office to coordinate a date. So I uh, guess if you're interested in learning more about the club, we'd love to have you make your way over to this corner table where you will be greeted by industry legend Craig Sherman uh, for a brief overview of our club. And with that, our meeting is adjourned. Nice to meet you. How you doing? I need a favor. Yeah.